The next one, it's, it's showing you, the next slide, <laughs> it's showing you um, how, how bountiful it can be the monsoons. I mean, the monsoons, I got my first monsoon rain last Saturday. It was, it was so strong that electricity blew off. I don't have, we didn't have electricity for a day. And that was all right. Uh, so here, it's from winter to the monsoon, same year. It changed a lot. Uh, we had peanuts from the Rio Sonora. We have tepari beans from the Tohono O'odham. We have squash as well from the O'odham. And we have some tomatoes that are phasing out right in here. This plant that you see here is um, camotes. I'm forgetting the word there in English. It's a sweet potatoes, I think. Uh, the camotes expanded very, very nice. So this requires irrigation. But if, you, if we go to the next slide, you can actually see how the monsoons can influence that. So it was designed that way because I get water from this section of the roof into here. And the Peace Garden allows water to come inside here and here and here, and it gets out of here. But water stays in here, infiltrating and maintaining some humidity for these wonderful plants, all right? So observation becomes a very, very important tool. But still, we didn't feel comfortable with the garden and da, 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 da. So we were following observation, what the water does in the backyard. This, this is becoming over fruit tree forest um, with uh, some figs, with some citruses in here, with this, this tree dye is an apple that it can, we can sustain it. So let's go to the next one. And you can actually see how water moves. Do you see all this? This is water. This is the wonderful source of water right in here. So I love to experiment with things. I say, well, can I have flood irrigation in my backyard? Same as the hohokam, same as the tohono odom, same as the yaki, as the series. They use a lot of flood irrigation in their washes. But here is a home. It's a small backyard. Well, can I do it? Well, let's try it. So uh, let's go to the next one. I think the last image I have uh, it's, it shows the results of the flood irrigation. But I want to show you the sources that we have here in Tucson. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more of that. But this map represents different areas where the wonderful organization of Native Seed Search uh, has collections of seeds, seeds from any of food production. And so anywhere in the Sonoran Desert, Tucson is very well positioned because we have wonderful organizations, we have monsoon seasons, we have uh, winter seasons, and it can be, your house, it can be such a productive unit uh, of food, such a productive unit of pollination, such a productive unit of water. So imagine your house being a productive unit and the monsoons provide a wonderful opportunity for that. So let's go to the next one. And, and, um, and talking about monsoon, this is when the electricity went off on Saturday. That's why you see the cuts in here. We slept outside. And, it and we got cold, like around three in the morning. It got really cold, actually. So this is how the garden is looking right now, all right? And I hand, we hand watered this from the tank. And we have different, different things in here. Let's go to the next one. I think it's more detailed. Um, I love squash. So you can continue seeing the squash here. They're fading out. It's getting, it got too hot for them. Uh, we did harvest some of them. We ate them, but the heat, they just keep dropping the flowers. Um, so from pollinator gardens to producing gardens to food production gardens, something I didn't mention is I love cacahuates, para mí los cacahuates es, es lo mejor que hay en la vida. For me, peanuts are so exquisite. And that's what I plant every year. I'm becoming an expert on peanuts. And those peanuts, I have two varieties right now, potentially three. Uh, they come from Sonora, from, from the Rio Sonora. And I have some from Magdalena. And I also have, I started last year with, from, from Spain, from Valencia. 
And so it's very interesting to see that I'm producing peanuts right here in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, and it's always a challenge. I have some friends that are also producing, like Jesus Garcia from Mission Gardens. Um, he's the one to blame that uh, we started growing peanuts in here. <laughs> so pay attention to what you like and, and pay attention to what you can grow to, so you can enjoy it. All right. That's okay. very, very important. I'm going to stop there. And if you have some questions, I think there are some moments for questions, but now I'm going to pass the screen to Nicole. Great. Thank you, Joaquin, for that great introduction um, to what you've done um, at your house. So, um, and I did see a question pop up. Um, Mitchell, we will get to um, where Joaquin has found those peanuts in just a little bit. That's one of our resources that we are going to give you. Um, and Nicole can do um, her introduction. All righty. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of native ecological perspective of desert gardening and how I've been involved with um, native ecology and, and native plants. And when I'm using the term native, I'm just going to give just a tiny little frame of reference for everyone. So I'm talking about Sonoran Desert Natives. And you can see in this handy dandy map from the Sonoran Desert Museum that um, the Sonoran Desert covers a large part of Baja, parts of California, parts of Arizona and Mexico. It's that kind of chartreuse green shape there. And so I'm talking about native species. I'm talking about uh, Sonoran Desert Natives, so species that are that live in and have lived in that little chartreuse area for thousands of years. And then if we want to talk about Arizona Natives, then we would talk about species that are specific to that little chartreuse blob, but within Arizona. So um, just to give you guys some perspective on what I'm talking about with Native. So we can go to the next slide here. So um, I think a large part of what I think about when I'm gardening and thinking about the monsoon season is that a lot of people perceive the desert as that image in the upper, I guess, your, yeah, each of our left-hand corner. <laughs> I always have to do this. Um, when for thousands of years, um, as Joaquin was talking about, the Hohokam people and the Tahono Atam people have uh, cultivated this bounty in the desert. And they have a completely different frame of reference for um, how we think about the desert. And I think that the monsoon season is an, a special time to reconnect with um, that perspective because we can see the desert coming alive, um, it's native and other edible cultivated species. And so I'm gonna talk about um, some of those species a little bit in this presentation. And we can go to the next slide here. And so another dimension of like the, the native species uh, dimension and ecology is that um, we spend a lot of time blocking the desert out. We spend a lot of time building walls and building little micro communities that um, aren't really connected to or celebrating our native desert species at all. Um, and so I included some pictures of this fabulous woman um, harvesting choya buds and Brad Lancaster from um, the uh, Desert Harvesters group harvesting the skate pods right here in Tucson. And, and you can see from groups like this that why, why build a little microcosm? Why build walls? Why keep the desert out when it has so much to offer us, especially some of our native desert plants, native edibles um, that we can talk more about if you want to. And we'll get to that later too. Um, so you can go to the next slide here. So my experience with the desert um, has been with this little property here out on the other side of the Tucson Mountains, um, just about 10 minutes away from the Sonoran Desert Museum. And before this property, we started working on this property, it was 
it had been bladed. The entire one and a half acre property was bladed. There were a few mesquite trees left, but pretty much everything was compacted, bare, your typical like development style. And the things that I learned here was that um, before we can really see the deserts found too, we have to offer the desert a little something. And what we can, and you can go to the next slide. And oftentimes what we can offer the desert is just leaving it alone. <laughs> um, it's a, a gardening can simply be observing and letting nature take its course in many ways. That's um, kind of a restorative approach to gardening. And so I've observed this little parcel of land for three years or so and watching, as Joaquin had mentioned, just watching where the water wanted to move, watching where things were growing and letting nature take its course. So over time, we've had various seed banks um, come back to the property from the adjacent natural and disturbed area. Um, so disturbed areas, if you, even when they've been bladed and compacted and completely, uh, the ecological community there has been totally destroyed. It's very easy to just let nature do the work and it will bring in natural seeds from the surrounding environment. You can bring in seeds you can bring in native plants. And the first thing that I brought in here was trees. And those trees provided little islands of nutrients and shade and things for many of these seed banks to establish and start growing. So we can talk a little bit more about um, some of these species and principles and things in how you garden. But this was like, essentially, you could call me like the lazy gardener. like. Just plant some trees and then let nature do its work and then observe and do what you can to enhance what nature is already wanting to do. And you can go to the next slide here. And so yeah, this is just another example of a before after. So we have this little area over here, compacted soil. And then if you go to the next slide, um, we planted in some trees, some Arizona rosewood various cacti, some mugwort. Um, this was one of the wetter areas on the property. So we did kind of like a little um, mesoriparian, semi-riparian corridor through here. But yeah, choosing plants, seeing where the water wants to go, and then um, choosing plants, native plants, that can tolerate the amount of inundation um, in that area. And there's a lot, it's a flood, it's a flood zone and a flood plain through here. So we're getting a lot, a lot of water from the Tucson Mountains coming through here to support these plants in particular. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So this was a horse corral and the horse corral was so compacted that we were getting very little uh, reestablishment in that area. But as we'll talk a little bit about, um, you can make the most of pretty much anything. Um, you can grow anywhere you want to, it just depends on um, how much work you want to put in <laughs> uh, to that spot. So restoring it ecologically would have been hard, so we decided to site our greenhouse on that particular parcel. Um, and this is the greenhouse that I helped build um, by hand in the summertime. It was, I wouldn't recommend that. I recommend <laughs> um, waiting during, during monsoon, monsoon season until it cools down a little bit. Um, but anyway, so my experience gardening has also been through this greenhouse. So you can think of, um, you know, in the landscape or as Joaquin was talking about, your backyard or gardens, you could think about a greenhouse. Um, but this greenhouse is really connected back to the native landscape because you can go to the next slide. Um, inside this greenhouse, we're growing native plants and many cacti who specialize in succulents and um, endangered succulents globally. So many of these species are extinct in the wild and they're, this is the only place that they exist anymore is within this small little home in the desert. So um, just thinking about our home being a home for more than just us and ecologically speaking, being able to do a lot for um, destroyed and threatened habitat and species in our area and around the world just by um, making a little space in our own backyard for those um, those little creatures to grow. Um, 
So you can go to the next one. So these are just some examples of things that were growing in here slash gardening, cultivating in here. I guess it's getting more on the horticultural side of things a little bit, but um, this is our native barrel cactus. You can see the babies there. They're maybe um, six months to a year old. And you can see my friend um, out in the wild with them with an adult that's maybe like 40 years old. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then getting back to some of the, the small but precious abundance that the desert offers us during monsoon, this is our Graham's nipple cactus or pincushion cactus. It's one of our native Mammillaria species. And these little red fruits are delicious. You can harvest those when they um, show up when, and they typically show up after any periodic rain. So monsoons are a special time for these special little um, fruits and treats that you can find and harvest um, in the wild or in your own backyard if you're cultivating some of these guys. And you can go to the next slide. And then these cacti are also my muse, my artistic muse. So um, definitely think about what inspires you. Like Joaquin, peanuts are his inspiration. And I have <laughs> quickly turned into a cactus freak that loves to spend time with observing them and um, drawing them and um, watching them grow over time. So whatever your inspiration is, think out of the box. And then in urban environments, I wanted to talk a little bit about between where I live and in urban environments that sometimes we don't have nature to bring the seeds in for us. So we do need to do a little bit of harvesting for our own garden, but that can be as easy as a walk around the block. For example, this little selection of seeds and fruits and things that I collected all came from maybe a quarter mile walk that took me about 15 minutes. And there you go, I have a starter that I can sprinkle or transplant to my yard that's um, all native slash some non-native edibles that I can use in my own backyard. So, getting creative in terms of how and where you harvest um, to start cultivating your garden for free, <laughs> which is a plus. Um, and also in terms of like for free uh, and the lessons that the desert can teach us, this uh, beautiful mesquite tree, like I was mentioning, um, has this lovely shady canopy where its babies all sprout along with various wildflower colonies. It's a very precious little parcel of organics and shade where lots of things like to grow. So if we observe that happening in the desert, then we as gardeners can create that similar environment, but also we can use that as a resource. So these uh, mesquite uh, seedlings here that are maybe like a year and a half old, I dug those out of the ground as tiny little um, seedlings underneath that mama mesquite tree, and I just plopped them in some soil and started growing them. So. <laughs> And then the same with those, um, those desert marigolds there. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And so right now, an exciting thing during the monsoon is, of course, the, the saguaro harvest and saguaro flowers and fruits starting to form. And you can go out and not, <laughs> you need a permit, depending on where you go, but you can find those seeds. You can, so when you're harvesting the fruit, um, you can think about not only eating the fruit, but also harvesting the seeds, and maybe you want to start a little saguaro farm. That could be cool, too. Um, and then ultimately, I think that um, a lot of what I'm trying to say here is that when we get creative in terms of recognizing the abundance of the desert, learning lessons from the desert, and um, striving to cultivate more abundance through our own garden, then then we start to share and we can start to share with the birds and with the tortoises. And, um, and if you go to the next slide, we can share with each other um, and we can take care of each other. And so we're starting to um, build a positive chain of events with our gardening that gives back to a lot of people and a lot of cultures and the place that we live in really meaningful ways. So that is my introduction. And thank you very much, everybody. First question that um, we have for Joaquin and Nicole is, is the monsoon a good time to plant trees? 
Um, and what native trees can you plant during the monsoons? Nicole. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that one is, um, I think, a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, it depends. I think that's our favorite word in rainwater harvesting and planting is it depends, their favorite phrase. Um, I would say we've had uh, strange monsoon seasons the past few years where they've come late and been rather unpredictable. Um, normally it would be an okay time to plant trees um, with that extra moisture, but now I would say that unless you're willing to uh, rely on yourself um, and potentially a lot of uh, loving care <laughs> out in the heat watering those plants consistently yourself. Um, it might not be a great time both in terms of your plant uh, or your health and your tree's health. Um, what about, what do you think Joaquin? Um, again, I'm looking at three, two mesquite trees and one palaberti here from my house. Uh, and again, looking at nature is very, very important. I mean, the mesquite tree give us the pots on um, uh, the fruit, las pechitas in Espanol, uh, in May, they're on the ground. They're waiting for humidity. Uh, and as soon as we get, and, and I got some rain on Saturday, and so maybe in, within this week, maybe I'm going to start seeing a little sprouts coming up from, from those pots, from those mesquite seeds. So following those patterns of the natural uh, pattern of growth, that's very, very important. Uh, uh, so again, it just depends on where you are, depends on the humidity. But if the mesquite tree give us the seeds in May and if they get humidity, they will start growing within the monsoon season, any time between July and September, they will start growing, so. And I think Joaquin brings up a good point of microclimate being a huge factor in how and where you plant. So if you have a tree um, that's going to get a little bit of western shade or protection from western shade and is going to get fried, <laughs> then um, that might be a good spot and you might be able to swing it. So if you have more, the more gentle variables you have in your favor that are going to foster the plant's health, the better off you are, but then it's up to you how much, how much work you want to do um, taking care of it. Um. Great. And I think, Nicole, you had mentioned um, that these may, the list that we've got up might be um, something good to, to plant during this time, depending. Yeah. yeah, depending. So if you were going to plant, I would definitely highly recommend only choosing some of our most drought tolerant native desert species to plant, like the Palo Verde species, ironwood, and the uh, velvet mesquite. Great, thank you. And the next question, what other native plants um, are good to plant uh, during the monsoon season or, or now? Um, it's, 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 again, I mean, a lot of the uh, um, Opuntia species, like the prickly pears, uh, right now is, it's, it's fine. Those are always good to plant them. Um, they, um, they can grow, uh, they will suffer a little bit, but they, they will establish themselves. Uh, we did that last year along uh, the alley and the fence of our home. Now we have a great prickly pear fence. And, uh, and we actually, I think we did that in the summer. Uh, and, and we used those, the, the pricklies we planted, they were the ones that you can eat, the pads that are very tender, soft, no spine, uh, espinas and los cosechamos en, en mar en mayo uh, de mayo a junio se pueden comer y son muy muy buenos um, y, so any prickle is, is fine uh, if you have a basin in your house um, on, again the monsoons hopefully they're coming uh, so you're going to have additional humidity in there um, so, so, so right now there are some weeds growing 
um, and like the verdolagas, for example. Verdolagas are the, um, what is verdolagas in English? <laughs> it's, uh, uh, ah, it's one of the most wonderful uh, weed that you can eat in the Sonoran Desert uh, with just a tiny little bit of humidity. They just, they just it's, um, it's going to come to me. Uh, so I harvest some of that uh, already from the alley, already from the garden. We ate it for about two, three weeks. Um, and so anyway, uh, there are some weeds actually that you can actually eat here in the Sonoran Desert. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. We do have a question. And are there any vegetables that are hardy enough to plant right now? Yes, they are. <laughs> There are some, again, we started talking about the hohokam. There are some seeds uh, that um, are available uh, from Native Seed Search. And my three favorites are the three sisters, we call them, which is the corn, uh, the squash, and the tepary beans. If, if you plant those three together, um, you probably need to water them to germinate right now if it, if it doesn't rain in the next two weeks or so. Um, and, and, but those go very well together. I mean, the corn is, is the first one to pop up, then the, the temporary beans climb the corn, and then the squash gives some additional shade to those two plants. Um, so those three do great, particularly if they are the variety from, from the autumn nation, uh, and you can acquire those seeds on Native Seed Search. Uh, I have my own that sometimes I continue harvesting, particularly with the tepary beans and the squash. I have never been successful with corn, uh, but that just means some other people grow corn very, very nice here in Tucson. Nicole, any other vegetables that might be good to plant right now? No, I feel like okra is a relatively hardy plant that does well year round. Um, but other than that, I think a lot, a lot of vegetables are maybe a little too heat sensitive to be planting right now. No. Coming, coming back, this is the first time we planted and I got those from starters from um, flowers and bullets. There are some very nice eggplants. Actually, I've been harvesting them right now, um, but I plant those in... Uh, in May. Uh, so they're producing right now. It's a, to my surprise, the plant looks very healthy, very nice. Uh, they're not the, the nice round one. They are the elongated um, uh, eggplants one. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you for that um, question and, and the explanation. So um, as Nicole was talking about, um, def and Joaquin as well, definitely cacti are good to, to plant during this time. And here is a list of different types. Um, and so I will give you all a, a second to um, write that down. And then Joaquin, we do have a question um, that is in Spanish. So I will, um, can you see the chat? Uh, Verdolagas, what was one issue, the question? Está en español la pregunta. Sí. Oh, ¿por qué las opuntias aquí? La fruta es diferente que las tunas. ¿Qué tipo de prickly pear produce las tunas y otras frutas que, comer, que comen en México? Um, this is... Um, los nopalitos que puedes encontrar en los mercados, como en Food City, como en Fry's, Uh, a veces en Food City los tienen frescos. Eso se le llama nopal verdulero. Y es un nopal muy fresco, es un nopal sin espinas, es un nopal especial para comerse uh, fresco. Hay otros nopales que son productores de tunas. Es un, produ es un nopal tunero. Estas dos variedades incluso las puedes encontrar en Mission Gardens, aquí en Tucson. Pero también como experimento, puedes ir a Food City cuando estén vendiendo nopal verdulero y no te lo comas. Agarra una penquita y esa la puedes sembrar. En dos años vas a tener un nopal verdulero en tu casa. 
¿okay? Generalmente esos nopales vienen de, del sur de Sonora, uh, de la región de Huacabampo, más o menos así. Eh, espero que haya contestado la pregunta, uh, pero son dos especies de nopales. Es nopal verdulero y nopal tunero. Los, los nopales tuneros más buenos que yo he visto es el magdalena. Uh, con una tuna otra vez sabrosísima. Uh, es una de mis frutas favoritas. Uh, es muy diferente a las tunas silvestres. Uh, uh, it's very different. The, 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 I'm going to say this in English. The, the, wild, the wild tunas that you harvest in the wilderness versus the tuna from that particular prickly pear. Uh, actually, the tuna that The, the, the tuna that is produced from the nopales is, is a special type of, of variety. And I've seen those very, very nice established in Magdalena. Um, uh, is, is one of the most wonderful fruits that you can have in the Sonoran Desert. And Christian just uh, remind me of the, of the word is uh, purslane, is verdolagas in, in, in English. And purslane is actually a really nice uh, weed, it's not really a weed, uh, that grows in, in the wilderness right here. It's, it's, you can go to any park and you can see that. Uh, yes. Anyway. Great. Thank you, Joaquin. It's a naturalized yeah. non-native species. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think um, we will continue um, during this time to talk about um, different plants that you can plant um, during the monsoons. So I think this is um, The next part, tough shrubs, um, Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, are, are other things that you can plant during this time. And then we have a list here. Yeah, and these would be, again, like the, the most drought tolerant of the drought tolerant species. Um, and again, with that caveat of trying to wait until um, there's some rain on the horizon and just being prepared to irrigate because all of these are going to need irrigation for establishment. Um, it's not like, you know, we can just let them go during the monsoon without some care on coming from the human side of things. Um, so, but yes, uh, brittle bush and creosote and triangle leaf versage are almost bulletproof. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think they're like, in terms of resiliency, they're like up there with cacti in terms of the drought tolerance that they can handle. So, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And we can go back to this um, at um, the end as well, if you all are writing this down, but we will uh, continue on to, 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 to uh, wildflower seed mixes as well are something good to plant during this time. Um, some of them can look like this. And here is um, a list of different wildflowers that you can plant. Yeah, and Native Seed Search has the wildflower monsoon mix specifically for putting in the ground during this time. And that's a great, a great thing to throw down. Um, and the, the image there, you can see globe mallow and penstem and coming up here at the, the beautiful living lab. Awesome. Great. So um, we are talking about native plants um, and, and planting during a time where there may not be rain or there may be a lot. So um, do we need to irrigate in addition to uh, these monsoon rains if, if we plant these? Does it depend? <laughs> <laughs> that is the one thing that maybe doesn't depend. Um, Yes, I would say you always want to plan on supplemental irrigation for the establishment of your native plants during the hot season. So the dry and even through the monsoon, you'll probably need to do some supplemental watering depending on how much water we get. Um, and that would be through the first two years that you'll want to be planning on establishing your plants with supplemental irrigation. Great. 
And we will continue to um, answer questions in the chat box. And so our next question uh, is, what nurseries do you all recommend? And I think we do have a uh, question in the chat box about finding creosote. So do any of these nurseries um, have creosote? And why do we recommend these? Do you want to jump in? Uh, Spain Food Nursery is, is one of my favorites. Why? Because it's close to my house. I can bike there. I go on my bike. I order online right now and the plants are waiting for me outside. And they do have uh, um, Gobernadoras, uh, which is the name of the creosote bush um, in, in different varieties. Um, other, other Desert Survivors is another, is another favorite of mine. Um, and, and so anyway, I stay with those two. There are different um, uh, types of uh, nurseries around Tucson, and Tucson is really fortunate. We have actually a variety of, of nurseries, uh, but also check um, sometimes the Desert Museum, they have plant sales, sometimes Tohono Chu Park, uh, and also uh, Mission Gardens sometimes, uh, they also have plant sales. Uh, those three are kind of fun to, to, to go and, and see them because you can actually see the plants uh, right there established and growing. And, 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 uh, so anyway, I stop mm -hmm. there. Yeah, and Flowers and Bullets, I think, just had a plant sale, was it a few weeks, a couple weeks ago? Um, so you can follow them on Facebook for plant sales. And um, yes, we choose these nurseries in particular because they are all local and um, cultivate native, Sonoran Desert native species in particular. And I will add the caveat that um, Pima County Native Plant Nursery does not sell to the public, but if you volunteer there, you can bring a free plant home. So that's how I have gotten many of my baby swarrows. <laughs> um, Arizona Trees is a wholesaler. Um, so if you call ahead, you can get a bargain with them. And EcoGrow is obviously more specialized, so they um, do aquaponics and additional more permaculture things. So that's a good place for, spark, for starts and weird plants, especially succulents, if you're interested, but not necessarily native plants specifically. Awesome. So, now I think Joaquin, um, you were going to talk about veggie gardens. So um, what seeds are best to plant during the monsoons for veggies, vegetables? Does the next slide show those uh, three different seeds that, that, yes. uh, that we have there? So right there, you can see the squash that I was talking before the corn and the tepary beans. There is two types of tepary beans. There is white and brown. Uh, they both are fine. And so those three you can, you can plant right now. Uh, they'll be totally fine. And the source for seeds, particularly for, for, for a variety of, uh, of vegetables and for a variety of, um, of produce, uh, Native Seed Search is one of the best ones. Uh, you can find right now watermelons, you can find melons. Uh, um, those are fine also to, to, to start to plant them right now, but they, of course, they require irrigation. But once the monsoon are here, uh, uh, you can stop watering them for a week or two weeks, depending on the rain. Uh, and, and they thrive with that, with that water, same as the other plants. Um, so I stayed with watermelons from the Tohono Nation, melons, uh, squash, corn, tepari beans, um, and of course peanuts. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm growing my own peanuts. They, they're already starting. Um, they, they do require more water and it's a, it's a very long season. Uh, they're going to be ready in October or November for harvest. Um, uh, so anyway, I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you, Joaquin. 